On this episode of Big Boys Don't Cry, we discuss the film Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. You don't have to have seen the film to enjoy the podcast, but if you do listen without having seen it, just be aware there may be spo- spoilers. Enjoy. Alrighty then. <laughs> Alrighty then. I was, I was going to do that. I was, gonna, I was also going to sing like Elton John <laughs> just, just for fun, but I think it's I've done that be before. <laughs> you can never know how what it's you? like. Oh, like a for the minute, just that as soon as a cold light shine from you, man, I let the rain and a fish I'm in a beer. Did you see? Um, you know, he played at Glastonbury recently. He's doing his farewell tour and stuff, isn't he? Well, during Glastonbury, Vic Reeves was trending and I didn't really realise it was Glastonbury. So I went on and I'm going, oh shit, is Vic Reeves dead? No, it was because Elton no. John was playing at Glastonbury. <laughs> <laughs> Which is harsh, but fair. Very funny. Very funny. God bless him. Yeah. I mean, when I'm 80 or however old he is, I'm not, I'm not going to stop singing. I think you no, should exactly. carry on until you're dead. Um, what age is he? Elton John is seventy six. Seventy six. Okay. Seventy six years old. Yeah, when I'm when I'm that old, I'm still going to be singing. It's fine. And I'm still going to be standing. <laughs> I'm still standing, slightly worse than I ever did. <laughs> and well, you know, my, we went to see my granddad this weekend for his birthday. He's eighty seven. He's walking around. He's still standing. Yeah, exactly. He's in great shape. Exactly. He also calls Elton John Elephant John for reasons nobody <laughs> can fathom. But that's a whole other issue. Crikey. Uh, but yeah, that's the thing is like, you know, you could you could do an Elton John, you can do a Bob Dylan, you can do a James Hetfield. People's voices do deteriorate as they get older. I think Hetfield sounds good on the new record though. Oh, I mean, he does. He does, yeah. Obviously, but. but what what I mean is the higher notes he can't hit anymore. Yeah. Which is fine. Legs. That's that 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 that's what happens to singers as they get older. It's just just a fact of life, and people adapt to it, and they write songs that are lower. Um, you know, they do a they do a Tom Waits, for instance. Yeah, they play everything in drop C. Whereas yeah. that's that's what was good about new metal as well. It's our favorite era of music, obviously. That <laughs> they all started out in drop C. So when like when Slipknot are in their sixties, they'll still be able to do it. Yeah, precisely, precisely. Um, yeah, whereas, yeah, when you look at these, like, key singers that have incredible ranges and incredible power behind their voices, of course things are going to shift around a bit. It's just a fact of life. And maybe we need to be a bit more lighthearted about it rather than thinking, you can't dare make fun of it, but also, you know, people who think it's the end of the world if someone does sort of, um, lose their, lose an octave, for instance, it's fine. Absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, obviously, if I get up there when I'm 80 and I sound like that, I fully expect everyone to take the piss out of me. I hope that when I'm 76, I sound as good as that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I'll sound far worse. I won't even be able to do I'm Dill Danding anymore, you know. <laughs> no. You could, you could do I'm Evan Dando instead. And cover a Lemonhead <laughs> song. <laughs> Speaking of Slipknot, I um, saw an interview with Margot Robbie earlier today, and she said she used to be a metal fan in her teens, and she went to see Slipknot. Yeah, so I remember hearing the same thing about Margot Robbie, which is very cool. Margot have you Barbie. seen? Have you seen Barbie? No, the I have not. Heimer. It seems like the Barbenheimer. It seems like the kind of thing we should be talking about, but I can't go to the cinema. Can I? <laughs> You're not allowed after what happened last time. No, yeah, last time I went to see Dungeons and Dragons: Order Among Thieves, and it was good. So I'm not allowed anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I also rewatched that on the plane. <laughs> Well worth it. I need to rewatch it at some point. It was. Fantastic. I've heard good things about Barbie. I have. Me too. That yeah. It's, that it's enjoyable. That it has obviously surface level feminism stuff, which is fine. That's what you expect from it, and it's an enjoyable ninety minute movie. The word on the the grapevine is that it tries to have its cake and eat it in terms of both satirizing the patriarchy, and and kind of just upholding ridiculous beauty standards and for women and whatever that it tries to have its cake and eat it and it succeeds so you know oh, fair play to it nothing wrong with that i've also heard oppenheimer is really really good 
but I'm not going to go sit in a cinema for three hours to watch Oppenheimer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've also heard that it's really long. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it is like three three hours long. <laughs> you could fit two whole Ace Venturas in there. <laughs> You, you get, and it's probably better than watching two whole Ace Ventures. Oh, yeah. But uh, Oppenheimer, I, I have heard good things. I like Christopher Nolan in general, though I, I've seen only I think some of his earlier films. I haven't seen his more recent ones, where I think they're becoming a bit more bloated. So, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I would, I would disagree about Christopher Nolan. I think he's always had the bloat, apart from those very, very early movies. Um, that he did i think the bloat has been there since at least the batman movies it was always there don't get me yeah. wrong he's always he's always had a bit of a bloat to him <laughs> he's always been a paunchy lad <laughs> <laughs> um but like i mean apart from i mean memento and insomnia I think literally everything after that has had this extravagant bloat to it from Batman, The Prestige, Inception, Interstellar. I think he's always had that to him. I'm one of those people who actually really enjoyed Tenet and it's actually quite a weird film and I appreciated it. I've never seen it. It's good. It's very strange and I appreciated that it was strange. The only issue is that the audio mix is very odd. Um, But apart from that, it's actually a very interesting movie and has... People always criticise him, him for being like, oh, he's an imperialist conservative movie maker because look at Batman. It's like, yeah, no shit. That's because every single superhero is conservative, like fascistic vigilante justice. That's you heard of this the, thing called comic books? It's literally <laughs> the nature of superhero comics. That's that's the intrinsic root of them. You can't get away from that. Um, whereas then, yeah, when you look at things like Inception, like... Um, even Dunkirk, the way that Dunkirk is about the humanization of people, is far from the sort of patriotism that people expect. And and in the run up to Oppenheimer, people saying, "Oh, it's going to really glorify the bomb." Uh, I'm not sure that it is. No, I mean, I think there's a lot of very surface level interpretation of Christopher Nolan's work. I mean, that is a factor, right? In the person you, the person that you are doing the film about helped to create the atomic bomb and was a big part of that right but at the same time i've heard that it is humanizing and it goes into all the other stuff that happened in his life that i think people don't know about like that he was accused of being a communist and all of this stuff like it's a portrayal of a historical figure right it's not saying (laughs) a bomb was good like it's a bit more complex and nuanced than that exactly it's like making like the movie downfall for instance people didn't go oh this is glorifying glorifying hitler Hitler. yeah it's just (laughs) You can make movies about characters in history without glorifying them, and you can explore these themes through their lives. Um, and like literally every screen that's been shown from Oppenheimer looks like the guy's about to have a nervous breakdown. I do not think that this is a film that's going to glorify the atomic bomb. No, it's impossible. Um, All those, um, and it's the same people who say that you know. Friday the Thirteenth is glorifying people appearing and murdering in your murdering you in your dreams. You know, it's stuff like that. <laughs> Do you mean Nightmare on Elm Street? That's the one. Friday the Thirteenth is the the hockey mask. Guy. That's that's yeah, that's summer camp hockey hockey mask. Although of course right. the hockey mask only appears in is it movie three or movie two? The hockey mask I might be know. movie two because initially he's a sack on his head. Right. I don't know and if I've ever seen any of those. Have you not? They're good no. fun. The best one is the one where he's dead now and then his grave gets struck by lightning and then he comes back to life. <laughs> That's the best one. Yes, but we shouldn't be glorifying zombification, should we? We should not be glorifying zombie serial killers and therefore Friday the 13th is cancelled. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, it's, I'm, yeah, glad, it, I'm just glad there's a lot of film discourse around at the moment. Everyone's talking about films, <laughs> which is which makes a break yeah, from yeah. everyone talking about TikToks and football, doesn't it? <laughs> Although there's a lot of football discourse. Yeah, we won't get into is. that. I could bore you all day with the football discourse. You could. And with whatever Formula One car stuff as well. I opened oh, my man, Google there's chat Formula and there's a One. picture from Toka Touring Cars 2 in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I brought up Tucker Touring Cars 2 um, on Twitter I yesterday saw, I saw. and actually had a conversation with one of my Twitter mutuals about Tucker 2 and how great its soundtrack is because it has this amazing sort of breakbeat garage drum and bass soundtrack. UK garage. Yeah, ex- literally UK garage. Yeah. <laughs> a British touring car garage. 
um yeah it's it was amazing literally came out of um you know that wasn't me trying to set up something to make you angry it was just an organic organic discussion about talker too well it did make me angry i'm furious <laughs> that surely is the only like me- piece of media that crosses over the two meanings of garage <laughs> maybe maybe garage for you americans garage um so speaking of things that make people extremely angry <laughs> Ace Ventura. Ace Ventura. A film from our childhood that I had completely forgotten. (laughs) Yeah. What did you remember about this film before you went? I don't know. I must have seen it when I was maybe, not when it came out in 94. I think my parents would have been sensible, but I definitely saw it like on TV or we rented it from Apollo Video once, maybe when I was like nine or 10. Um, And all I really remembered was the clowning, right? Oh, yeah. I remember him going, Can I ask you a few questions? You know, it's stuff like that. Ask you a few questions, I mean. <laughs> I was going to say, get the pronunciation right. Please. Well, the, the great thing about that is that it works whether you do the American or the British pronunciation. <laughs> do you mind That's if true. I ask you a few questions? Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? That's the um, Sherlock Holmes edition. <laughs> that was Yeah, that was Will Ferrell, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Um, you wouldn't have been surprised if he did that in Holmes and Watson, but he just like no, bent over no. and yeah. I had a friend at school who used to do that, like literally bare <laughs> ass, just like go into the classroom and go, do you mind if I ask you a few questions to a teacher and then run away? Did it with surprising regularity. <laughs> um, and I, I did find myself thinking well, of Holmes enough, and Watson I'll, I'll, I'll cut this, this because it's personal information, but his name was Moriarty. Oh, very good. Very <laughs> good. forgot about that. Um, I did find myself thinking of Holmes and Watson whilst watching this movie, actually. Do you think um, Ace Ventura walked so Holmes and Watson could run? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I enjoyed Holmes and Watson more than I enjoyed the rewatch of Ace Ventura. There were some really yeah. nostalgic bits of this that I enjoyed, but there is a lot of very dated humour, yeah. which does make it unpleasant to watch in the modern day. It's tricky, isn't it? Because I was watching about the first 30 minutes... I was really enjoying it. I was loving yeah. it. And then suddenly halfway through, it just takes a really horrid turn. And then the rest of it is just like horrible humor that's mean spirited and all sorts of things, isn't it? That just genuinely makes it an unpleasant watch. Yeah, it's it, it's true because to begin with, it's very Dumb and Dumber-esque in terms of there being, there's a slapstickness with a nastiness behind it and it works. And Dumb and Dumber never gets particularly into that horrible bigoted humor no but there's still this cruelty behind it here and there which actually makes the slapstick elements more effective and it's just the right side of that line isn't it if you think about that in comparison to something like billy madison for example Mm. where Mm. all of the humor is just mean-spirited and it doesn't quite land does it occasionally a bit of it does but most of it is just adam sandler saying here's a nice piece of shit you know, and like that yeah. could also be a description of the film. And Dumb and Dumber is kind of <laughs> just the right side of that line. Whereas Ace Ventura is like way further along that line. But then at some points is much funnier than either of those films. Yeah, it's it's very strange that when it gets it right, it's still incredibly funny. But there is thematically and plot wise, it comes from a very nasty place. And I think that's where the problem lies. Yes. Um, and boy, howdy, do we have a lot to talk about when we finally get to the sequel, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't nastiness. have time to watch it. <laughs> um, but here, you've got homophobia, you've got ableism, you've got a lot of transphobia in this film. Yeah. Um, the central conceit of the plot twist is transphobia. And even the reviews at the time said that it was homophobic. Yeah. It was like 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah, and it is it is an, it is an unpleasant film, and it's just it's so annoying because it it doesn't seem like that initially, right? That no, side of no. it doesn't come out at all until halfway through the film when it suddenly decides that it needs to have a plot, and you think when the guys were writing <laughs> yeah, it, it's like exactly they went through all of this quite funny stuff and quite a good setup with the the dolphin and I almost said the whale, the dolphin and the Miami Dolphins and the whole thing, and then it's just like how can we tie this up and create a villain? And then they decided to go down a transphobic route with that. And then it's just like, you could have done better guys. Come on. If you, it's like, it's like Radiohead writing bad songs, right? When they can write good songs. It's like, (laughs) you've got the first half of a really good and funny film. Why not just like 
fill that with a whole bunch more slapstick stuff and not worry about the plot too much. Um, <laughs> I found something uh, really great the other day. Um, the worst possible Radiohead set list. Oh no! So someone's put together <laughs> this this amazing thing on um, on uh, on 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 YouTube, where they've got like a an audience sound going, and then they're going through these various things from Radiohead's past. Um, so, for instance, the Creep remix by Tom York from 2021, which is just this horrible nine minute long dirge um there's there's audio of someone messing around with a radio to start playing the radio head song the national anthem not finding it so they skip it to then go on to the next song um they start using the beeps to that go into paranoid android obviously a very popular radio head song but instead it goes into one of the shit ones instead um the best one is talk show host featuring james corden (laughs) Oh god. Which do you know the song Talk Show Host? No. It's a really underrated Radiohead song from the early days that got put on the soundtrack to um Romeo and Juliet, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Oh well I'd know if it's I It's a great it then. it's a great song. Um and yeah, so it just continues continues going and going and going like that. Um and then yeah, it just gets progressively worse for a full hour. It sounds like my worst beautiful. nightmare. I'd rather it's watch true. the climax of Ace Ventura on a loop for three hours. It's a true piece of art. I hide, if anyone here is a fan of Radiohead, um, I I highly <laughs> recommend checking it out because it made me love what, multiple. Nobody times. here is a fan of Radiohead. <laughs> I'm going to make your kids fans of Radiohead without you knowing. Oh god! I'm going to be like, hey, listen to this. I'm going to play them all the good stuff, and then I'm slowly going to get them into the bad stuff. All them, um, all three of so- three songs then. <laughs> I know that you like more Radiohead songs than three songs. Four, maybe. <laughs> I know that you're a fan of um, what's it? The Benz. Yeah, the, the Benz, Benz is okay. The Benz is a good album. Um, I like the. I in terms of Radiohead. Welcome to the Radiohead cast, where I talk about Radiohead and Paddy gets incredibly. Just what I've angry. always wanted. <laughs> it's always been my aim to transition <laughs> this show into a, a full-on Radiohead podcast. So I like the Benz. I like OK Computer. I know lots of people think it's overrated, and it is sort of overrated, but it's an enjoyable album. And the best bits on it are very, very good. I like Hail to the Thief, which is the one that nobody likes, yeah. um, which is a very good album. And then I liked their last album, A Moon Shaped Pool, was very good, actually, and was less shit than the last couple of things that they'd done and less pretentious than the last couple of things that they'd done. Is that damning with faint... <laughs> Well, that's not even faint praise, is it? But, Damning but, with a, an insult. Well, lots of people really liked... Lots of people really liked In Rainbows and The King of Limbs, and I got incredibly bored by both of them so much so that I generally don't yeah, listen limbs. to them. That's such a stupid name. What does that mean? <laughs> it's a guy with lots of limbs. It's uh, Mr... What's he called? Mr. Wiggle from Mr. Men. Oh, He's yeah, the, King the, of limbs. the guy with the arms. Yeah. I Mr. See, Tickle. Right. Is it Mr. Mr. Tickle? Tickle? Mr. Wiggle. <laughs> That's the Wiggles. That's something else. <laughs> um, yeah, the king, the king Yeah, King of Limbs is just Mr. Tickle from Mr. Men. Of course. Tom uh, York's favourite guy. Tom York's favourite book series. He loves the Mr. Men books. He gets very annoyed if when he turns up to play a show, the entire library of Mr. Men books isn't there. He gets furious. That's why he went off and did solo stuff because the rest of the band were like, "Oh, Tom, do you want to do you want to tone it down on the Mister Men books?" And he was like, "No, fuck you." One day they got there and the Mister Men books weren't on the rider. He he lost it. <laughs> he gave him the hungry caterpillar instead. Yeah, and that that was it. It was all over. Someone got fired for that blunder. <laughs> it was all over. Anyway, um, how did we get onto this? I can't remember. Oh no, I was saying that it's annoying that the people who made Ace Ventura could make a really good first half of a film and then that they had to make the plot happen using mean-spirited, bigoted humour. Yes. Yeah, that's the problem. Like like you said, the first half hour of this film is very cool. It... Um, the 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 silliness the 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 slapstick element setting up him as this maverick renegade detective character all works really well and then it starts descending quite rapidly from that point 
I think pretty much from when he goes to the fancy dinner do um, and nearly gets eaten by yeah. a shark. And that scene is very, very good. But then after that point, it starts really descending quite badly. After that point, it jumps the shark. <laughs> he survives the shark and the movie jumps the shark. It doesn't even show you how he survives the shark. Yeah, you're right. That's kind of a turning point. Now, I, I think the turning point is when the romance starts to blossom with Courtney Cox. Because at that point it starts to that starts to feel fake as well, and then you're like that wouldn't actually happen because he's a repulsive goon. <laughs> I don't mind that. There's been the enough repulsive way. goons having romance in movies for me to accept that this could happen. Um, the the issue is when when he does the montage with the. Um, Super Bowl ring. Oh yeah, yeah. When they decide to advance the plot using a montage, yeah. that that montage is really when the homophobia comes in, and then of course it eventually becomes transphobia very, very strongly as it goes on. Yeah, um, you get that ableism in there. There's quite a lot of nasty jokes about mental health in here. Um, it's and that's when it really starts unraveling quite badly. I think. Yeah, it really does unravel quite swiftly. And you're like, I just want this to be over now. Yeah. I'm still enjoying the score. I'm still enjoying the occasional goof, but I want this to be over now. Yeah, it just, we don't want the plot. I wonder if the animated TV series has held up any better. I know that's a thing, isn't it? I never saw that, did you? I watched it as a kid. It was on TV when when we were little. I don't remember ever seeing it. They did three Jim Carrey animated series. They did one around Dumb and Dumber. Um, one around the mask. Which do you remember the mask that that was? Yeah, thing? yeah. And all three of those films came out in '94, didn't they? Were they all '94? I think so. Yeah. So it's here. Ace Ventura: The Mask and Dumb and Dumber. Three films in that year. He was the second highest grossing actor that year after Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I don't know who was it. Thomas Hanks. Yeah. Was he in one of his movies that year then? He, he did some movies that year, yeah. yeah. He did some, f- probably Forrest Gump. All the long, yeah, I bet that ones sounds I like seen. that sounds like a Forrest Gump year, doesn't it? 94, yeah, that's got Gump written all over it. <laughs> Let's go. It wasn't, it wasn't the fucking horrifying CGI train man. CGI train man. Train man. That was, that was a whole <laughs> other thing. No, that was much 94 later. we just had Forrest Gump but in 93 there was Philadelphia and Sleepless in Seattle so and how in was 95 the, I read was, that he was the highest gross, grossing actor that year how is that possible and 90 well maybe it works on the financial year and one of them was 93 uh, a couple of them were 93 went into 94 or maybe they were counting at the other financial year which could include Toy Story right and Toy Story and Apollo 13 depending on when they were released, so maybe it's something like that. I see. Um, this is, yeah. But out of those movies, Toy Story is the best one. But even then, I, I find Toy Story kind of irritating these days. I think I'm getting grumpy in my old age. When was the last time you watched Toy Story? I don't know, a few years ago. But that, when I think about it, I think, oh, that was an irritating film, wasn't it? See, when I think about Toy Story, my wife was just holding her phone up and the message says, are you moaning that your family didn't show you Forrest Gump again? No, I'm not, because I don't care about Forrest Gump. <laughs> when did you previously moan about your family showing you not showing you there Forrest was a, Gump? There was a whole thing on my like family group chat about the fact that I've never seen Forrest Gump. You ain't never and seen Forrest Gump. was like, Gump. you've never seen it. Yeah, <laughs> you've seen Forrest Gump. And then I was like, well, thank- what well, my dad was weighing in. I was like, well, you didn't show it to me then. What are you doing? <laughs> you got weighing on that. Forrest Gump, and he was making fun of me for not having seen Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump is fine; it's fine. It's not the best Robert Zemeckis. We know that obviously the best Robert Zemeckis is Beowulf. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. No one in Forrest Gump Gump goes, "I will slay your monster." <laughs> I will slay your monster. Life is like a box of chocolates. Although I will it's say, slay your monster. I will say, best Robert Zemeckis is Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which might be controversial to some yes. people, but I think it's the best. I, I agree. Oh, what a movie. That doesn't have any transphobia or homophobia in it. No, and that was made way before this. Yeah. What were you playing at, Ace Ventura? Directed by Tom Shadrack. Tom Shadrack. Who directed a lot of really shit 
films of that era. <laughs> did The Nutty Professor. Oh, no. That is did, a horrible film. Did Liar Liar. Liar Liar is a, is a masterpiece. Like, that's <laughs> that's the thing. I, I, like, I love Liar Liar. We talked about that, didn't we? Yeah, have we done Liar Liar as an episode? I think we have, yeah. Probably about 200 episodes ago. <laughs> did Patch Adams. No, did did a Bruce. Mortish... <laughs> <laughs> did Bruce Almighty and Evan Almighty. I haven't seen Evan Almighty. Bruce Almighty's fine. It's fine. It's just... It, that That's the waning of Jim Carrey's Jim Carreyness. I think. It's Bruce Almighty. Yeah. But then apparently he... Um, like had a car crash or something and then decided to make like a, a really serious film a, a documentary about his about like things being wrong with the world and stuff oh and then he hasn't done much since so that's called i am from 2010 oh, it actually looks quite interesting oh i've not heard of this oh, a bicycle accident right. what is wrong with the world and what can we do about it i think <laughs> thing is if i Maybe this is just me as an awful human being, but if I was if I was going to do something like that, I would then follow up the really serious, really thoughtful documentary with the most awful <laughs> comedy film you've ever seen in your life. I would make another Juice Bigelow. Yeah. <laughs> the Nutty <laughs> Professor 3. Or, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I would come back for another Ace Ventura movie immediately after that, and people would be like, wow, what an incredible insightful um insightful documentary and then i'm just like yeah next movie four hours of fart jokes baby surely there's a there's an ace ventura juice bigelow crossover waiting to happen like yeah. the, hum- the tone they're tonally quite similar aren't they i mean again i juice bigelow is shit obviously it's total <laughs> rubbish and doesn't have any of the redeeming features i mean the, the clowning i mean as much as jim carrey does a very problematic performance in this film he is a genius he is a comic mm. genius, and Rob Schneider is not. That's the <laughs> that's the difference, isn't it? This movie, in spite of all of the horrors that it unleashes on the audience, is still a better film than anything Rob Schneider's ever done as the lead. Yeah, and that's, that's absolutely fair. It's and also a lot of them are actually more mean spirited in different ways too. Yes, um, I mean this and is like a, consistently mean spirited. Yeah, whereas this, the mean spiritedness, you're just like, oh, that's so disappointing that that's happened because there's signs of something better. Yeah, and like thematically mean spirited as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't. No, that that would be a hilarious move. And he hasn't made a film since what? Well, he's then made another documentary in 2018, or like a biographical drama of some American football player. So. Like, it's just, like, yeah, he needs to come back and do something really, really dumb. <laughs> yeah, he's got to do something awful next. Come on. Yeah, yeah do another Nutty Professor. Uh, Ace Ventura meets Juice Bigelow. Juice Bigelow's a fish guy, right? I feel like they'd get on. That's true. That's true. They'd have something to do there. Uh, it'd be they go on a, a trip to somewhere and then they're racist about the people there. Like, like Juice Bigelow's European <laughs> vacation or whatever the second <laughs> one was called. European gigolo. That's the one, yeah. Yeah, that could work. That could work. Maybe they could do that. Right. Come on, Tom Shadiak. This this stuff writes itself. You give us the executive producer credit. It was Big Boys don't Big Boys Productions. We'll fund it, but we'll be hands off. Did they ever do did he ever go to Australia? Maybe they've got an Australasian crossover. Yeah. Ace Ventura versus Juice Bigelow down under. Work yeah, there we go. We'll work it out. There we go. That would work. Um, so I don't really, I would say let's go into the plot, but I really don't want to go into the plot here. Um, There's no basically, need. basically the plot is, um, transphobia is the plot and ableism towards people with mental health conditions as well. That's the plot of this movie. Um, which is a shame because yeah. they didn't need to do that. <laughs> a dolphin really... gets stolen. The person who turned, who stole it is, is a trans woman who then is made out to be villainous because of that. That's all you yes, need to know. Really. Yeah. Um and and the idea that the either the transness was created by the evil 
or the evil was created by the transness. It's yeah, kind of exactly. muddy which way round it is, but they suggest that there's a connection between the two, and that is not particularly pleasant. Yeah, and it's equated with mental illness as well. Which it's is very pleasant if you're a member of yeah. the um, media class in the UK at the moment. This would probably be your favourite movie. I was going to say, I, this seems like yeah, gender criticals are going to love this one. They're going to be they're going to be up in arms about it being cancelled. But it's very yeah, it's very uncomfortable watching if you have a soul, unlike the transphobes that are in England. Yeah, who, I'm going to say this now. They're they're <laughs> they're soulless husks. It's a, it's an uncomfortable watch if as long as you have um, compassion. Yeah, if you're a compassionate people, human being, this movie's not for you. If you're an asshole, you might enjoy it because it appeals to the fact that you're an asshole. You'll especially enjoy the bit when he says, "Can I ask you a few questions?" Because it'll be like <laughs> looking in a mirror. <laughs> That's something they should put on the poster. If you're an asshole transphobe, you might enjoy this stupid film <laughs> from 1994. Where are they putting up posters for this? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the rest of the people that are part of the transphobia movement peaked in the 90s, so I assume that maybe their movies do as well. Like that awful comedian guy who was in Gimme, Gimme, Gimme. Who? Um, do you know you know the, the show Gimme, Gimme, Gimme? Vaguely. It was, a, it was like a sitcom in the 90s. Um, and the guy from that is, is a big old transphobe now. I'm searching it, but it's just coming up with ABBA, and I'm going to keep it that way, <laughs> so keep it's not it to sully my Google algorithm. But no, the thing, thinking about it, you've also got Father Ted Man, you've got Woman Whose Book Series, although they were successful in the 2000s, were all set in the 90s, because that's when she peaked psychologically. Helen Fielding. <laughs> nah, I'm joking. Harry Potter was in the <laughs> 90s, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I'm not forgetting that, It wasn't, which explains why nobody's got a mobile phone. Yeah. By the way, on that hilarious note, just to bring things back to Final Fantasy VII, in all of the Final Fantasy VII media, like the prequels, whatever, they're all using flip phones because that was seen as like a futuristic thing. So they've got all this like amazing technology, this whole like really technologically advanced world. But because they they didn't have the concept of smartphones, they are all calling each other on flip phones. And I love it. I love that kind of thing. Like in the Alien universe where um, everyone's using sort of like 70s style computers still. Yeah. Um, like DOS based uh, systems and things like that. It's like it's there's something really powerful about maintaining that aesthetic in the modern day, even though our technology is advanced, because it maintains the kind of futurism that was around at the time that it was created and it keeps that cohesion going. Yeah. Um, Command line interface. That's what it's all about. The um yeah, the for instance, the alien uh horror video game, Alien Isolation. Um, is all like that it really feels like a follow-up to the original movie and all of the tech within the game is very much based around that as well it's oh it's very good i love it when stuff sounds good and there's a um a cell phone in ace ventura as well and he's like don't do that you're going to give yourself a brain tumor (laughs) (laughs) yes yeah he does that's what they thought in 1994 and that's what some people still think don't they yeah, yeah. I still say that every so often. The same cranks who are like, you should never stand in front of a microwave. <laughs> and 5G is is causing us to grow hair on the backs of our tongues. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the one. No, 5G caused the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, gotta love it, slash hate it. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that there's lots of uh, climate change conspiracy theory going on. Oh yeah, yeah. As well at the moment, it's really, really going down that route at the minute, um, which is concerning. Um, I, I think that Ace Ventura might be a climate change denier. Although he loves animals, I bet he, he's, he's all about that. Oh, actually, uh, why do you believe in climate change if it's cold in July? Yeah, they're going. Look at my thermometer, guys. It says it's twenty degrees. That's cold. <laughs> exactly how could there be ice caps if it's climate change yeah that, that's precisely it isn't it yeah i reckon he'd be one of those guys it, he would talk out of his ass as he's wont to do <laughs> precisely precisely um so um cannibal corpse let's talk about cannibal corpse. cannibal corpse are in this movie they have a cameo they're playing at a club yeah. that he's then at and then he 
is very dismissive of metalheads, which again is a reason not to like Ace Ventura because we as know if, metalheads yeah, are very as, nice people. As if this film wasn't loaded with enough prejudice. Yeah, and then he's just like, "Oh, metalheads are jerks." It's like, no, you're the you're the transphobic, homophobic, misogynist asshole, Ace. And who calls themselves Ace? What's his real name? Roger. Yeah. Roger Ventura. That actually sounds like a cool detective's name. Yeah, but he, he's got to go by Ace, doesn't he? Yeah. The Blue Jays mascot is called Ace. Oh, really? Yeah. Why is he called Ace? Is he is he also a pet detective? No, he's just like a big bu- big stuffed bird guy. <laughs> big stuffed bird guy. That's what his name should be. Who? Well, until like the mid-2000s or later, around that period, he was called BJ Birdie. So they had to change that, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Excuse me, they should never change that. That's the perfect name. Those Canadians and their bawdy humour. Um, so were there things about this movie that you liked? How mm. did you feel about the the script? Were there any lines of dialogue that made you laugh? There were a lot of um really great cuts. So like bits when they're talking about they're having a conversation about like skeptical about hiring a pet detective or whatever, and the, the woman who says yes hiring him says Pet detection is a very involved, highly scientific process, and then it cuts to him falling off a roof in pursuit of a pigeon. Yes. That's, there's a lot of yeah. very good moments like that. Um, yeah, those cutaway gags are very are very funny, aren't they? Yeah, but no, it's, I think it's more the physical comedy, actually. Like, the, the title sequence and the kind of first scene, genuinely, that is like a masterclass in cinema in terms of making a statement about the kind of film that it is and hooking you in, and it's just him, like, dressed as the UPS driver kicking this fragile package around and like playing football with it and goofing around and pretending he's playing, he's like doing a touchdown or whatever. And then he gets to the guy and like there's obviously some action. The guy chases him. He's stolen his dog or whatever. Like that makes a statement. Right. And I, I thought that was brilliant. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I think you're right that it really plays into his skills as a, as a physical actor quite well. Um, there's that really great scene at the guy who's been murdered where he's screaming and opening and closing the soundproof door, yeah. the soundproof glass. <laughs> and that's a genuinely very funny scene, which I appreciated. And there's there's bits like that where you're like, oh, actually, yeah, there is some there is some humour in here that works. Yeah. Um, you've also got the very tiresome one-liners that people can say like like a glove yeah or what's you realize that a lot of the like things we used to say at school came from this film (laughs) yes yeah that kind of thing there's lots of that in here if you want to hear things that people quoted when you're at primary school this is the movie to go to yeah this could tell you a lot about the 90s what it was like (laughs) for you gen zers out there yeah, if you wanted to know what horrors were in the 90s. Otters coming out is... of the toilet. <laughs> this is where you can go. Um, that was a lovely scene where, like, yeah, it's, the landlord is like, you haven't paid your rent and there's animals in your apartment. And they go in, there's no animals. And obviously, you know exactly what's coming, but it's still a glorious moment when all the animals fly out to Ode to Joy. Yes, yeah, that's a very good scene. And the final scene in the movie, too, is fun, <coughs> where he's beating up the mascot. Yeah, the game. that's a nice like comic finish, where they, they yeah. again try to redeem themselves by doing something that's funny, but it can't roll back from all the horrendous shit it's been doing for the last half hour. Yeah, because it is gen... I know we've, we've, we've laboured this point by now, but you cannot understate how nasty this movie is. No. Which is which? It really is a curveball versus the other um, Jim Carrey movies of that era, like like Dumb and Dumber, like The Mask. This this is a much crueler film, which is a shame because it has high points that are probably higher than the other two. Yeah, I mean, it's been a long time since I've seen either of those films, but I don't think they have anything that's as like really tips the line from being like a bit mean spirited into just like outright bigoted. Yeah. Yeah, which proves once and for all that secretly The Cable Guy was the greatest movie of the early Jim Carrey films. You're going to keep banging that drum, aren't you? I love The Cable Guy. I mean, I've not seen that in years. Maybe there's some horrendous stuff in there that, that's gone down very badly. There probably is, yeah. But <laughs> but, but I, in my head, I'm going to pretend there wasn't. Because what did we have? We had... We had Ace Ventura, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber in 94. We had Batman Forever in 95, which is an underrated Batman movie, um, along with the Ace Ventura sequel. 
we had the cable guy in 96 and then liar liar in 97 and then truman show in 98 which have we talked about the truman show on you know i'm not sure if we have i feel like maybe we have i'm gonna that's one where I, i'm gonna have to look back to through the archives we've definitely that's done something liar, we liar. should yeah we should talk about the truman show if we haven't done already yeah because that that's his turning point isn't it that's the the moment when he says i can actually be serious whilst also still being funny and endearing as well yeah and then he you know he does man on the moon the andy kaufman thing um and then um the majestic is another one as well isn't it but then he also Mm. branches out into doing like exclusively kid stuff like the grinch which is great and then does stuff like eternal sunshine as well so he really broadens the kind of things that he does we've definitely done eternal sunshine and then um and then now he's just doing sonic the hedgehog (laughs) Which you haven't seen it, have you? No. He his performance in that honestly is as good as anything in the nineties. It's so good. The issue is that Sonic's a jerk. He's of just course, a bit of a jerk I want a character. I love that way you make them. It's, yeah, it's full of fun stuff like that. Honestly, you should watch it. It's great. Sonic's not a jerk in it. In which case, it's not true to his character because he's always a jerk. Well, he's kind of a jerk. <laughs> but Ben Schwartz is voicing him. I think it's impossible for him to be a complete jerk. Should we mention Ace Ventura Jr. Pet Detective? That's the third one that I've not yes. seen. Have you seen it? You've not seen no, it? No, it's probably I've awful. It's probably it. as bad as that Home Alone one that we did oh, watch. Oh, I'm that was sure it's as bad horrendous. as Home Alone. Um, where it's his son. Home Ace, Ven- Home Alone. Ace Ventura himself. This is his canonical ending. <laughs> he he um, he's, he's apparently gone off to the Bermuda Triangle and disappeared. <laughs> Of course, that, that, that's what ha- that's how they explain that that um, that Jim Carrey's not in it, and then yeah, we get some kid who wears the exact same clothes as his dad, <laughs> and is a pet detective, um, which I'm never going to watch. I'm sorry, we're no, not, we're not going to watch. No way, Ace Ventura Junior. It's from the director of Beethoven's Thirds and Beethoven's Fourth, by the way. Just just keep digging that hole. I'm never going to watch it. Like, as well as The <laughs> Sandlot 2. Oh, no. So, <laughs> um, this person just makes sequels to movies that didn't need sequels. I mean, someone's got to do it, right? That's a, that's a niche. <laughs> someone's got to make these. Um, the Sandlot 2, though, that is... That is incredible that they did a Sandlot too. I mean, I've never seen the Sandlot because it's baseball. Isn't it's it? fine. People love it if they have nostalgia for it. It's a good like baseball film, but yeah. Is is it about kids who play baseball? Is that basic? It's about kids who play baseball. Yeah. Oh, he also hold on. No, the guy who directed Beethoven's Third and Fourth and the Sandlot Two also directed the original The Sandlot. Oh, okay. So that's a quite. I'm listening, then. Maybe they're all great. Have you watched Beethoven's third and fourth? No, I refuse to. <laughs> you don't count them as canonical entries. No, really important. Absolutely not. They're fan fiction at best. <laughs> Beethoven's first and Beethoven's second are perfect and have Charles Grodin in them. And then after that, no. What no, separates that. Beethoven's third and fourth from Air Buds three and four? Mm, I mean. They're all about different sports, though the Airbud ones. So they all have quite good thema- <laughs> have a good thematic hook, whereas the Beethoven ones are just tedious sequels. As opposed to the thematic hook of Big Dog is Slobber. Yeah. <laughs> it's big Big <laughs> Dog was play in, basketball. Who was in Beethoven's the third? Who did they get in? I don't want to know. Surely, at that point, the original Beethoven was dead. <laughs> He jumped off a cliff. He'd had it. <laughs> yeah, they said well, they had two films. He's like, oh, now I get to retire in peace. No, nope, here you go. Have another one. <laughs> it was Judge Reinhold oh, who was okay. he was um, yeah the in Beverly Hills Cop wasn't he? he yeah, was the guy yeah. who was um, Eddie Murphy's partner or junior or something in in Beverly Hills Cop films. I can't remember. I'm suspicious of anyone called Judge as a first name. <laughs> Judge Judy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can't trust Judge Judy. Judge Rinder. Judge Rinder, yeah. 
Um, who he wasn't a judge, was he? He was TV a TV judge. He was he was a um, barrister, I think, rather than I a judge. I don't know. Wasn't he? <laughs> My wife is texting me pictures of Beethoven, the composer <laughs> and the dog. <laughs> She's on the other side of the glass here. She can hear me. No, I will take it aside to say Judge Rinder actually seems like a really decent guy. And he does loads of like documentaries about vulnerable people and stuff. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? He's one of those people like, um, who's the who's the money the money man? The good money sense man? Martin Lewis. Yeah. Who's He's sort like of... a national treasure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you're the, right. These people who have sort of come out of... Yeah, these people who have come out, and Dr. Amir Khan's another one, who have come out of sort of being these vaguely sort of TV-based personalities giving advice around certain things, and then they're just doing good in the world. (laughs) And you're just like, wow, okay, fair enough. Martin Lewis has only one strike against him, though, which is that he sang on that Christmas single with Lad Baby last year. (laughs) So he contributed to their sausage roll grift. It is a grift, isn't it, God? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Um, no, yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? And now, of course, Carol Vorderman is the official leader of the opposition. It's uh, all, all sorts of weird stuff's going on at the moment. I'm just reading Judge, Judge Reinhold's <laughs> Wikipedia page. Reinhold was nicknamed Judge because when he was a baby, he looked stern and judge-like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, so I've got one more thing to share with you today. Um, did you know that Jim Harry has... Jim Harry? <laughs> I mean, it's appropriate for the film, right? It is, yeah. If there was a gorilla dressed as Jim Carrey, Jim Harry. And could describe the plot as well, I yeah, suppose. True, true. Um, Jim Carrey has said the following about a potential Ace Ventura 3. Um, I think after the fact, when there's been a lot of years, unless some genius person, director, or auteur comes to you with a completely new take on what's going on, um, he wouldn't be interested. So he said, um, if Chris Nolan came to me and said, I want to make Ace Ventura and I want to do something more interesting, then I might listen. But for the most part, after a certain time, there's not one cell in your body that is that person anymore. So you end up just imitating what you did in the old days and the original inspiration isn't there. Did he specifically say Christopher Nolan? He specifically said Christopher Nolan. <laughs> Please let his follow up to Oppenheimer be Ace Ventura 3. That would be so reboot. good. One one thing that I wanted to mention is that there are whispers that they are finally making another 28 Days Later movie as well, by the way. Speaking okay. of a Killian Murphy film. So Killian Murphy's keen, Alex Garland's keen, and Danny Boyle is keen to do a 28 Years Later. And that might feel like a bit of a jump, but actually the 28 Days Later came out in like 2003, 2002. Yeah. <laughs> so by the time it gets made, it will probably be 28 years after oh, the original one came out. Yeah. Yeah, um, and cool. I would be down for that because I love 28 Days Later yeah. one of my favourite horror movies I think it's a work of genius truly brilliant and 28 Weeks was not particularly great so yeah it would be nice if we got a good one Yeah, like getting another scary zombie thing again after all these years you know 28 Days revitalised zombie movies if the sequel could then do it again that would be that would be quite something. It's either going to be Christopher Nolan's Ace Ventura or Michael Bay's Ace Ventura. <laughs> uh, excuse me, Luke Besson's Ace Ventura. Oh, that would actually be amazing. <laughs> I'd love that. That would be fantastic. Um, there's, n- there, I think there's a vague similarity between this and Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets in the way that it deals with the kind of creatures, right? Yeah, where it yeah. involves them in some scenes and kind of has them interact with the human characters. Yeah, I could see that happen. I could see that happen. Um, so, have you got anything else you want to say about Ace Ventura? Um, I, I think I touched on this, but the score is fantastic. Like, it's yes, all that kind yeah, of nineties sort of rock funk going on, isn't it? It does the Mission Impossible music when he's sneaking around, but like that's the only thing that it kind of borrows from something else as a joke. But overall. The score is perfect for what it is, and I think it's a really big contributor to the kind of to the goof factor and the vibe that is perhaps overlooked. Um, and it's a shame that it kind of it carries on being good while the plot just really takes that massive d- downhill shift. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. And also, the cinematographer was Julio Macat, and I was like, I recognise that name from somewhere. I'd seen it also on the credits of Home Alone and Home Alone Two. So oh, great, well, great CV for him. 
And there also, his name is Julio, my cat, <laughs> which is appropriate to the film. Very good. Very good. Um, so, um, how are we going to rate this movie? Let's see. How many animals are living in your apartment illegally? Um, seven. I've not got that many. I've not got that many illegal animals. Yeah, the bits I... in this movie that are good are really good, but it is really let down by how nasty it is. Seven out of 20. I think that's fair. Yeah. Sorry to be a woke soy boy beta cuck about this, but it genuinely does take away from the enjoyment when it's that nasty a film. It's, it's horrendous, yeah. And as such, I wouldn't actually recommend that you watch it unless you sort of are comfortable with the fact that it's going to have that kind of very problematic content that's going to be an unpleasant watch. Yeah, if you, you have that it, nostalgia for it from the 90s, then you'll probably enjoy it and still get that out of it, at least for the first half. But if you've never seen it, I probably actually would say you don't. Or just yeah, watch the first 30 minutes and then turn over. Unless you've got, you know, this is a genuine warning that it goes into some nasty places. So to avoid it, if you're not comfortable with that, if you can, if you do feel comfortable with it, then you can watch it. But um, but yeah, it is just a warning ahead of time. It's not particularly pleasant. Yeah. But the good thing about that is that hopefully once all the right wing guys hear this podcast and they start, they realize that it's a big problem that Ace Ventura is going to be cancelled and that we're being too woke, they'll all leave Barbie alone and then come and start defending Ace Ventura. Yeah, that's going to be the next Ventura is going to do like a 45 minute video destroying woke guys who tried to cancel Ace Ventura. Yeah, he's going to come to the cinema dressed as Ace Ventura. <laughs> that's wow, well, Ace Ventura Jr. He's a very short man. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to shame him for being short, but it's just very funny. I do. He's a he's an awful human being. Sorry, Ben, but you are, and you are pathetic, and you have a bad voice. Mm. I mean, that's the main thing I have against him. He's got an awful voice. Yeah. Listen to us. Listen to else. our wonderful, luxurious voices. Our uh, lugubrious tones, like Adulted sipping tones. a brandy next to a roaring fireplace, and then you listen to Ben Shapiro. How could how I still don't understand how people can watch a Ben Shapiro video without wanting to tear their ears off, quite frankly. But I and think it's, it's part it's, of the shtick, isn't it? Because it's designed to provoke outrage and it's annoying. It's designed to annoy you. So he knows he knows what he's doing. I think that's not even his real voice. The main people that watch him and that buy his grifting merch and everything like that, they're the people that agree with him. So they're not doing the rage views. They're they're genuinely enjoying it. No, but it. they're annoyed by the thing that he's talking about. Like he's they're getting riled up about Barbie by watching his video about Barbie. And then you've got Lawrence Fox who also has an awful voice voice they they all have bad voices that's the main that's true all of them Jordan some peterson's got that kermit thing going on <laughs> evil like... kermit yeah they should they should do someone should do a scientific study into whether people with annoying voices are more likely to be right wing i think that's true you know and whether people with cool voices are more likely to be cool left wingers like us like us because you great. could listen to me saying do you mind if i ask you a few questions <laughs> on a loop all day <laughs> Like a glove. <laughs> well, all righty then. <laughs> That's what um, Winston Churchill said when it was time to drop the bomb. <laughs> oh, and on that note, goodbye. <laughs> on that note, what are we watching next? We've kind of we're supposed to do an animal month, but I've kind of failed at that because I had to go away. And it's gonna yeah. be it'll be Ventura next. Right okay, now. other Ventura. Do that. and then we're gonna save Alvin and the Chipmunks for after that. Yeah, yeah, we'll do Alvin and the, the Chipmunks. Because I'm about after. to go away for another two weeks, so you'll have to hang around, people, to hear what we think of Ace Ventura <laughs> Two: When Nature Calls. <laughs> yeah, exciting stuff. Good times. All right. Well, um, you can find us on Twitter at Big Boys Don't Pod. You can email us Big Boys Don't Cry Podcast at gmail dot com. Always love to hear from you. Hope you enjoyed or maybe did not enjoy Ace Ventura. It's up to you. <laughs> we'll be back next week. <laughs> To talk about Ace Ventura 2, When Nature Calls. Alrighty, bye-bye. Bye-bye.